Okay, hi everyone, and welcome to this next lecture. Uh, today we're going to be talking about the development of information systems. So over the past weeks, we've talked a lot about uh, the, like the requirements engineering, how to keep systems secure, uh, the potential of systems, and today we're going to look take a closer look at how these systems actually come to be. Don't worry, we're not going to talk about programming. There's a lot of other great courses about that, but we're going to really take a look at the management of these projects and what is involved in uh, making, uh, managing and making an information systems implementation in an organization. All right, so let's get started. Um, you may have seen a lot of things about information systems development in the news. Here in the Netherlands, uh, an often used example is the Dutch government, who does a lot of information uh, and communication technology projects. And it doesn't always go well. Well, the reason I'm uh, using this example is not per se because the government, I think the government is doing a bad job, but because of course, when the projects don't work, it is in the public. So we do have a lot of more information about these projects where companies that may have n had non-successful IT implementations of projects might not be in the public. So um, if you wanna know more, there's this uh, about these IT projects and, and the government, there is this great video from Arjen Lubach uh, who did a, 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 um, a segment in his show about IT projects and the Dutch government. So I'll put the link in, in the description and share it with you. Clicker. Beta. Um, but essentially, if you look at the headlines, you will see a lot of these news items. The government and IT projects don't always work together. Uh, a failed IT project, the costs are exceeding, the time is exceeding, and so on. And this has actually led to um, the government being more open about these projects and what is happening. So they have a website now, the Rijks ICT dashboard slash projects that shows uh, which projects are currently running. So at the moment, there are 79 projects, uh, IT projects running at the federal government, the national government in the Netherlands. And they are big projects, uh, multi often multi-million uh, dollar industry. So as these projects are being developed, uh, companies are involved and probably um, some companies now in this Corona times are also doing information systems implementation. They are rapidly transitioning. Well, we talked a little bit about the IT and security risks in a previous lecture, but today we're going to take a closer look at, uh, at what is involved in managing such a project. And of course, it depends a bit on the scale of the project, the scale of your organization on how that would actually manifest. But what we're going to do today is look at a few key elements that will play a role in each of these uh, projects, uh, regardless of their size. Um, so keep that in mind. So, you know, we'll, we'll refer back to some of these projects from the government throughout the lecture, but try to think about these examples uh, in your own case, in your own project, in your own organization, and see if you can recognize some of these elements uh, that might apply to your projects. Okay, so let's get started with these um, um, with this uh, lecture. So let's first talk about how and why we do these investments, uh, because in the in basics when we talk about information systems implementation, it is about making a investment, and inve making investments is essentially about making decisions. Um, we've in uh, in literature, we there is a lot of information about uh, decision making, and when we make decisions, whether it's investment, whether you take uh, you know your shopping cart or whatever kind of decision you're making on a daily basis, uh, you follow a certain process. Sometimes it's more deliberate, sometimes it happens very fast, uh, but when we talk about IT projects, they're usually very conscious decisions that are are being done. And we follow, you know, what we call an ideal decision making process or a rational decision making process. So we're going to use that today throughout the lecture as a structure to talk about how uh, these IT projects are being implemented. Now, the reason I put this picture here uh, of a 
spherical cow is because it, often in science uh, we make assumptions or we give uh, certain uh, conditions to our results and our theories. For example, that the ball and the feather will drop equal speeds in a perfect vacuum. Even though we know that those perfect circumstances do not exist or not exist on Earth or not in daily life. So that is often jokingly referred to as consider a spherical cow. Consider something in perfect circumstances, something that is not possible. So the same applies here to this decision making process. What I'm going to show you is a way to think about making decisions. It is in ideal circumstances, provided that you have very rational, you have information and so on but it's often not reality. How, however, it does that kind of theory, that way of thinking helps us to structure uh, this lecture a little bit and helps us to provide a structure to talk about IT projects and uh, investments. And that ideal decision-making process looks as follows. It starts with recognizing that you have to make a decision. Uh, you wake up in the morning, you need to get to work, you have to make a choice. You realize you have to make a choice to either take the car, use your bike or uh, take public transport. So the next option you have uh, when you realize you have to make a choice is you look at what are my options. And as I mentioned, the options could be I'll take a bike, I'll take public transport or I go by car. So once you've identified your options, you are going to choose one of these options. You're going to evaluate which one works best. You know, you will take into consideration something like the weather, the costs, your health, the travel time and so on. So you for each of these options, you will assign values and eventually based on your uh, analysis, you will choose one of them. And, and use that option. And when you arrive soaking wet at work because you picked the bike and it turned out there was an unexpected rainstorm, you're soaking wet, you will evaluate your options for the next time and think, well, let's be more careful and more mindful about the weather. So that's essentially what we will call the rational uh, decision-making process in ideal circumstances. So if we translate that to uh, IT systems and IT investments or information systems and developments, it starts with recognizing that we have to make a decision that there is a problem to be solved or an opportunity to be gained. Uh, so the first step is to recognize this opportunity or this threat or this uh, risk that we're facing uh, that drives us to make a decision and try to get a full understanding. So, for example, a decision could be needed to make uh, to optimize something. We want to maximize our profits. We want to sell more. Uh, we want to increase welfare. Or it could be used to minimize the impact. We want to make less cost. We want to reduce our expenses. We want uh, our employees to stay longer or uh, not leave the company. Um, so those could be triggers to, to recognize that you need to make a decision, you need to change something. And sometimes that trigger is not explicitly there. It could be because somebody has a brilliant idea or because you want to try something new. So decisions could be triggered because you want to accomplish something or reduce something, but it could also be an external factor or an idea you want to pursue. But in any case, when you recognize that decision, try to think about the objective. So what is it you're trying to get what the outcome would be? So, you know, get to work on time, for example. Um, it could be that if you're having a bigger decision, there are multiple objectives. So you have to prioritize and classify them. Uh, I want to get to work, but I want to be there on time, but I don't want to uh, impact the environment too much. So classify these different objectives and conditions uh, as well. All of that information about understanding the problem comes back to what we would call building a business case. So a business case is what you uh, a justification for your investment. Why do we need to make that investment? And that investment could be to keep investing in a project that's going on or to convince people to invest in a new project. So it will show you that there, the business case is the motivation behind the need to make a decision. And it is built on a set of arguments. And for example, to show that an information system has an added value to your organization. And often you need to lay out the cost and the benefits. And that business case will be 
the basis for deciding, yes, we need to make an investment. We need to, you know, start pursuing the alternatives. We start, we, this is a decision we have to make. So uh, the business case is sort of the recognizing that there is a decision and there is an urgency to need that make that decision. But building that business case is not always easy because if you want to lay out the costs and the benefits uh, for information systems, it is not always a clear cut case. For example, there are several ele elements that make it difficult to uh, convince people or to present this business case. Uh, when, you, for example, um, you need to talk about measurements. How do you measure uh, the benefits? So if you talk about efficiency, you could talk, you could talk about cost reduction, but you could also talk about excellence, you know, being a, a leader in your field. Those things are harder to measure in, in uh, monetary units in euros or in dollars. So a high quality product, um, you know, will increase your competitiveness, but that's harder to express unless you can talk about forecasted sales. So initially, um, you know, investments will, you know, require you to spend money and uh, it will be harder be it will be harder for you to justify what the benefits in the long term will be when you have a better market share or better position than your competitors. Uh, another problem is the redistribution. So, um, for example, um, uh, when you you know invest something in a big corporation, one department might invest and the other departments will reap the benefits. So justifying where the benefits fall and pinpointing that is sometimes hard to prove to management. So um, even if you invest something, other people might benefit. If you have a bigger corporation, other departments, for example, might benefit from the investment your department has made. So that is harder to make the business case. It could even be the case that if you launch a successful product on the market, that the whole market size will increase and other competitors will also benefit from your investment. Um, so the read, we call that the redistribution is not always clear cut. It's not because the person who has made the investment will also get all the benefits. And one of the hardest challenges with information systems is to talk about the investment versus the the time you will get the, the financial gains. Um, you have to make an investment upfront. You need to pay developers, you need to pay companies to deliver products, to implement information systems, to train your users. But when that investment will pay off is hard to determine. It could take months, it could take years, depending on the, how the market develops. So justifying an investment now um, compared to the benefits it may give in a longer period can be hard can be a hard case to make especially as you know the time lag and the diff time difference becomes bigger the higher the uncertainty usually is about the uh, the return on investment um and then the final part is that even though you have a good business case eventually your project could still fail because of other factors, including the mismanagement. So making the investment is no guarantee that there, that the, you know, the investment will pay off. There's always an inherent risks in launching products that you have to take into account. So that's one of the challenges in building these business cases, these elements that make it hard to uh, to say, well, we're going to invest in an information system that's going to, you know, increase our productivity, that's going to give us a competitive advantage, but it's hard to classify them, and there will be um, forces uh, acting against you to make that case. So, what are arguments you could use to make that case if you want to convince people to invest in the information system? Well, you could classify them roughly in three types of arguments. Um, starting with the first one is a faith based argument. So it could be based on the belief that your organization is one of the best organizations that you need to have a competitive advantage. So you build on the strengths and almost play on people's um, proud on their um, 
and their values on their identity saying well we're a competitive company we need to stay on the forefront so therefore we need to be the one with the most you know interactive website or have a good portal to serve our customers or whatever investment you want to justify so there you play on the faith or the belief that your company or your management the perception they have about their company so you play on those values um, the opposite of that would not be faith, but would be fear. So you use that you use it as an argument to illustrate um, the risks of missing out. So by saying, "Well, if we are not going to invest in this, you know, we'll lose our competitive advantage. Our market share will drop. Customers will go to uh, different um, different competitors who do offer that functionality." or we need to hire more staff because we're lacking behind in our administration. So the fear-based argument is actually not based on building on the beliefs, but building on uh, what the downsides would be, what the effects would be if you don't do that investment, if, if you will continue the old ways or if you, um, you know, um, don't catch up. So to give you, you could, for example, say, well, if we keep going like this, this system will be outdated in two years time. We need to replace it. If we don't, the maintenance contract will end and we need to pay more money. So that's, for example, a fear based uh, argument that Microsoft uses to move their customers to uh, new versions of Windows. If you will offer you support, uh, but you have to pay a lot more to get support for old systems. So um, you want to be safe, then you know you need to upgrade. And um, sort of the third factor, although I would argue you could, com you know, of course you can combine different types of arguments, and you should, is fact-based. So you use data, and you, of course, data could be the the basis of your fear or your faith-based arguments. But you use data to say, well, this investment will yield this return on investment, or um, you know, if the number of uh, computers that will need to be uh, replaced in the next year is going to be this amount. So you present facts that people can't argue against. But often it is a combination where you present a fact and then you translate that either into a faith or fear based argument, motivating people to do. Because presenting just a market share and saying, well, you know, this is our current market share. If we don't pursue this option, the market share will drop to this. Is it, in essence, could be market research and fate and in fact, but you will use it to play either on the fate or the fear of the people you present it to. And then building further on this business case, it often comes down to an investment analysis, which means you have to identify costs and you will have to identify benefits. And when we talk about costs, you could classify them in two categories. One would be tangible costs, uh, including the total cost of ownership. So all the expenses you will make to implement an information system. That tangible costs, those are euros or dollars you could count. And they could be once off, so non-recurring. So in initial payment, you pay once and that's it. Or recurring costs. So think about subscriptions or licenses or maintenance. So costs that will recur every month or every year or every X amount of days. Um, those are euros that you can calculate. And then there's also the intangible costs and those play a little bit on what we previously mentioned, the fear element. So what is the costs uh, if we don't invest in a system? For example, we lose customers. Well, those are costs you're gonna incur as a company, but it's hard to really express them in a number of euros. Um, so intangible costs are um, those that you cannot quantify. It could be, uh, for example, uh, your reputation loss. Uh, the same argument you could apply for ben benefits. So you could have tangible benefits, uh, you know, revenue increase, the number of sales that you expect to gain and so on. And then intangible uh, benefits such as increased customer satisfaction, um, public perception, um, um, you know, all those elements that um, that are harder to express in number of euros, at least directly. You know, of course, a good public image and improved customer care service will also result in higher sales. But initially, those benefits are harder to express in euros. And you would list both of them because they help to make your case. 
So eventually it is about presenting that case to management or to your investors or whoever is the decision maker that has rec that you are trying to convince, remember, recognizing that there is a decision to be made, that if we don't make that decision, we're going to lose out fear based argument. Or if we do invest in this, we're going to, you know, improve uh, our company's competitive advantage, faith based argument, and then argue using facts and monetary uh, value to convince them. So when you do these things, especially when you talk about the fear and the faith based arguments, it's important to really know well, who are you presenting to and what would be what kind of arguments are they sensitive to? What are the values that you want to uh, play into? Um, one of the things when building this business case is important to know is that there's probably a lot of, as, as, a, as a company or an organization grows bigger, there's more and more people involved in making that decision or that will have some influence on the decision making process. It could be your manager, but there's a good chance that when you talk about larger IT implementations or larger information systems that affect more people, that more people will have a say in this, an opinion about it, or will support you or resist in the change. Um, you can think about the management, of course, that, that will you know decide on the system, but there's also the IT department who has the maintenance or has a responsibility for keeping secure systems, offering user support. It's also the users themselves. So, uh, you know, eventually it's the users, whether it's your internal employees or your customers that will need to be able to use the systems. Um, and there is an interesting uh, aspect there about IT implementations and how it can change people's power because information is power. If you change in a large corporation and you take information away, put it in a system from somebody, they lose control and people will resist that. If you want to know more about that, there is a great paper from uh, Marcus from 1983 called Power Politics and MIS Implementation. It's an excellent paper. Um, e even though it's older, it's still very relevant today uh, about the transition that companies go through when they centralize information that people feel loss of control and they resist that kind of change. Uh, another group could be developers. So they could focus on uh, the systems. They have to make design choices. They don't want delays, especially if it's a contracted developer. Um, so all these stakeholders, and there's probably a lot more play a role. So how do you manage them? Well, one of the ways you could manage them is by using a power interest grid. Um, and this is from Mendelo, and it was in the paper from 1991. And you could classify these stakeholders across two dimensions. One would be the level of interest that they have, the level of motivation, the level that they, they have a strong opinion about it. It could go from high, from low to high. And another axis would be the power that they have to change things. So what, how, to what extent can they influence a decision again from low to high? And if you look at those quadrants you'll get, you can classify them in four different ways. So people with limited power, limited interest, you shouldn't spend too much time on it. They're not interested. They can't influence a lot of decisions. People with a low level of interest, but with high decision-making authority, you should keep them happy and should keep them satisfied. So those are, for example, um, you know, people who, who are keeping an eye on things, but not necessarily who you know, are responsible, accountable to some extent, but not necessarily intrinsically motivated to be part of a project. Um, on the other side, when you talk about people with a high level of interests, you could have people with a high level of interest, but limited power to influence things, at least individually, which could be, um, you know, people who want to follow the project, who might use your information systems, um, but they're not the ultimate decision makers. And finally, the key subjects are people that have a high level of interest, have skin in the game, um, and a high level of influencing these, uh, you know, the decisions that are being made. So if you look again at the stakeholders from management, IT department, users and developers, one way you could position them in this diagram is, is the following, you know, management uh, developers, they have a high interest, you know, they have skin in the game, they want to uh, benefit, invest in it, um, but they also have a high level of interest in it. Users, 
uh, themselves, they have a high interest in it because they are the ones who are going to use the system. Their job is probably going to change, but their power to change it is limited. Of course, you can give feedback and we'll come back to that uh, later on in this lecture about user involvement, but ultimately it's the management or who has to decide has to decide it. And then if you talk about support and the IT department, those people who you know will probably have an interest in the project, um, but are not you know the end user. They won't have. They may not have a strong opinion about the project as long as it doesn't change you know the impact their work too much. However, they do have some power because, for example, a privacy officer or IT security auditor or um, compliance officer could you know, stop the project potentially if they feel this, it will in affect the security of their system, especially if you talk about integration. Of course, these are just examples and there you could think about different arguments of classifying them, but mapping them, mapping all the people you're talking to, all the different groups in a grid like this will help you to identify how much time and energy you should invest in each group. Um, just keep in mind that when users, although a single user might not have a might not have much power, of course, when there's multiple people, multiple users getting together, they you know their voice becomes stronger and they probably their power or the, their ability to influence decisions increases as well. So uh, that's one thing you won't see in this diagram, but something to do keep in mind. When you're talking about groups and people start collaborating and forming alliances, uh, but that's that will be office politics uh, for a different lecture. So, why is it important to keep all these people involved? Well, we're going to transition a little bit towards the development and the acquisition of the systems themselves. So, we've talked so far about um, the making the business case and making sure that people are part of it. They're supporting you. Uh, that they're, uh, they have some skin in the game, that the people who do have the power are convinced using your arguments. But in the, in the end, you need to make sure that people are on the same page. And that is where an important part comes in is requirements engineering. I'll come back to that later, but I want to mention it now because it is something you do want to start with as early on as possible, because that's the way by talking to people about what the system is and is going to be, you can get them on your side. You can get them to understand the, your arguments. You can get them to move in this power interest kit to be part of the project and to also have some skin in the game and be your, uh, uh, your partner and form an alliance with you. The risk is if you don't do it, people might still think that this is a great idea, but you will have different perceptions. And that's actually illustrated in this famous comic from uh, Requirements Engineering where people uh, look at systems in a different way, that the customer thinks they're talking about something different than the manager thinks uh, a different way, you know, has a different view of what the project will be. Um, the developer has a different view. And sooner or later, these different views are gonna collide later on in the project. So you wanna start clarifying them as early as possible. Um, so let's take a look at that what that will look like these how do you manage these different perceptions when you start talking about the choices you have to make in getting information systems or developing them 